Hello, and welcome back to another week of the DP World Tour Picks and Bets. Skylar Hoke here, joined with Tom Jacobs. Tom, how are we doing? I'm good. I'd be better if Volleson didn't leave two putts one inch short on the back nine to uh, miss out on the playoff by two shots. But as someone correctly pointed out to me, he did also hold like 50 and 60 footers, so it kind of balances out in the end. Um, probably didn't play well enough to win, uh, but it's always a bit of a sickener when you come that close. That was probably the craziest 18th hole I have seen <laughs> since. I, I, the thing is, it's happened more often than than once. You know, I mean, that seems like a once in a lifetime type of thing. But I, I feel we have caught that once or twice a year on the DP yeah. tour. I mean, we lost a bet with Ryan Fox to Victor Perez in that exact same situation. A double bogey on the 18th, followed by a birdie with Victor Perez. It was a three-shot swing when it was about a 99.9% chance of winning, you know, and that's basically what it was. And Gavin's I mean, making a, a 30 footer. They are just incredible um, for, for victory. I mean, Xander Lombard with the Eagle Bjork three putting 18, right. Olsen just being short weird week. Um, my long shots were, were nowhere near the board, uh, but you take that with the, with the week like that. It was a tough week because, like, we we had different approaches, right? So I was very much like, I'm just going to go to the top of the board and, and kind of just stick to my guns based on how I felt the previous year went. Um, and whereas you and, and many others, you weren't alone, went with the, you know, it's a dropping class from the previous two weeks and we can take some long shots. And I actually think that may come to fruition this week as opposed to last week because we're moving out into Asia rather than the Middle East. And, um, yeah, we, we shall see how this week goes. But um i wasn't too surprised to say i mean obviously gavin's was i guess he was triple digits um but to win with a double bogey on the last hole is never uh never great but yeah i mean it, it it's interesting right i mean bjork bogeyed the final hole missed out by one but he didn't know at the time when he was really aggressive with his birdie part that he could have just you know tapped him for par and and got in the playoffs so it's it's all you know i guess tough to really work out you, you don't know in that kind of uh, situation Oh, for sure. For sure. You'd be sick if you're a Bjork backer, but you know, you want him to go for that opportunity in the moment every single time. And yeah, that he does. And I mean, most times it plays out like it did just a couple hours ago, you know, at Pebble Beach when Rose approaches 18 with a three stroke lead. Like that's just the way it should go almost every time. But um, no, I think we're on to uh, another week and a, an interesting week to say the least, I would say. Right. I mean, since we've been doing this show, this has to be probably one of the count on a uh, on a hand how many times at least you bring into a new area of the world that we haven't really been seeing the the European tour play as much with a new course, um, you know one that the grounds have been played in the past, you know and by past I mean still four years ago um, when not even on the same exact course. So we're, we're seeing basically a, a brand new test this week uh, with the Singapore Singapore Classic uh, at Laguna National Golf Resort Club. Um, and from everything we hear, and again, this is, you know, what, what you hear, what you read, what you look at. I mean, golf obviously has evolved, but we've got quite a challenge ahead of us this week. I mean, I'm excited for these difficult tests because we don't get them all that often. Yeah, it's, it's going to be, if, if everything you kind of read goes as it suggests, then it might be like almost too hard and a bit of a tough watch, uh, like, you know, like the US Opens have passed. Uh, and it just depends if you like that sort of thing or not. Um, I do, and it's fine. I think in isolation, I do obviously prefer just seeing good goal shots be rewarded. I think I read that they basically said this is one of, if not the longest back nine of any golf course on the European Tour, DP World Tour, should I say. Interestingly, did you know that the DP World Tour didn't tell the Asian Tour they were holding these two events in no, Asia? I, yeah. So so the next two, are they, is it uh, Singapore this week and wherever they are next week, it, both in, in the Asian Tour vicinity. Um, and obviously because they have kind of lost that partnership with the Asian Tour, they just didn't even inform them that they were there. So uh, the Asian Tour uh, head obviously took a, took a hit at them um, at the live event last week. So a lot of politics coming into golf and hopefully that doesn't creep into the play this week. Yeah, it's interesting to know. I mean, I I love the at least angles in which you can you can guess. You can you can go in with an approach and you can really see how it plays out. Um, and now a difficult course doesn't necessarily mean I apologize for the sirens in the background here. But um, I you know difficult test doesn't actually always mean 
a certain style is going to win, right? Like, I guess if you, you do compare it to a U.S. Open, you know, the, the distance is always a key, but you get grinders up top. You get you get people who can just find a way. And that's kind of how I tried to structure a card at, you know, look at maybe some some interesting courses that we see consistently, two of them being and, and brought up by some of the best European tipsters out there. Um, you know, Green Eagle um, in Germany, the Porsche European Open seems to be one that, you know, has that length, has the single digit under par scores. Um, and then one that I like a lot is Valderrama too, right? Uh, a demanding test, um, tree lined in, in some ways where even off the tee, you really can't take full advantage at times, uh, but you need to grind it out. I mean, we've seen, you know, even par be a great score there year in and year out. So those are kind of the two that stood out to me that I'm kind of looking at some angles at potentially. And I know you're really good at finding like location form or this area of the world of things that you kind of focus on. What are you kind of looking at? Yeah. So for me, I didn't look at those kind of comp courses until I saw Ben and, and Paul Williams kind of put them up and that only strengthened my case for one of my golfers. I'm really pleased about that. Who's a, a massive long shot, but my initial list was based on people that have just played well in Asia. Right. So we've, look, we've been to China a lot. We've been to Malaysia. Um, we, you know, we've seen players that play on the Asian tour. I think people that play with the Asian tour regularly, you know, your Kiribek, Afidam rats, your, um, you know, John Catlins and people like that would would obviously come to the fore, and I'm sure we'll talk about some of those later. Um, but also, I just think that ultimately, if you believe what they say about it being the longest back nine of any course on the tour, potentially distance comes into it more than more than we think. So um, ultimately, I think it's going to be one of those long driving events where you're going to need to scramble a little bit. I think there was only two players under par at the Asian Tour event that was won here not that long ago. Um, and I think eight over got you inside the top 20. So it's going to be a tough test. I think the Ballantines Championship, uh, which was on the DP World Tour before, was either held at this course or the one next door as well. So one to kind of keep an eye on. But in terms of actual correlating courses, I didn't go there just because I don't know enough about the course. I, when I do those correlations, I kind of go by four or five uh, banks of form, really. Yeah, I love that. I love that. I think it's um, just a different angle. You, you can come in. and I And I do think... We talk about it week in and week out, but experience on certain types of courses and areas of the world is, is very different sometimes than um, it can be in the state side thing where, where golf can be very similar, you know, in California compared to, to Arizona, like you're popping over this week. Even Florida to California sometimes isn't as drastic of a dis- difference as what you see in different regions of the world. Um, so that for, further emphasizes that. And then you couple that with the field that we are seeing this week, right? Um, that only adds to the angle uh, of where there's opportunity, right? You know, we have Bob McIntyre and Ryan Fox leading the field at 14 to one uh, at DraftKings Sportsbook. Jordan Smith um, is is branching out to the 20s. Uh, Audrey Arnas, Adrian Otegway, Alexander Bjork round out the five um, that are are six that are sub 30 to one. Any uh, that you're interested up here? I think a couple might be on your list. Yeah, so Bjork and Otegi for me. So Bjork was kind of in my mind as soon as I saw him playing well last week. And with Alexander Bjork, it's one of those ones where I think he's fairly limited as to where he can do well. Um, and you kind of have to keep that in mind. But he's won the Volvo China Open, which I love. Played, um, you know, played over there and, and played very well in that part of the world before. Also finished second in Hong Kong, which is another great Asian tour finish. 28th, 16th and 2nd, his last three starts kind of suggest that now that there's a bit of drop-off in class, he should come to the fore. So Alexander Bjork certainly is my favourite pick. It's going to be interesting to see the bounce back from the spot, right? I mean, I th- we probably take it too in-depth on, on worrying about that, right? It's just another week that they can show up and have an opportunity. And and Bjork, you know, has taken advantage. And, and the one that really I was interested in is is Adrian, right? And Adrian was the winner at Valderrama last year by, what, four or five strokes, right? An absolute dominant performance. Um, we've seen him show up at some difficult tests. Um, sell us on the why behind Adrian at his number. Yeah, again, very similar to, um, to Bjork. He finished second behind Bjork that time that Bjork did win um, the Volvo China Open. So I can't see any reason why it wouldn't suit him. His short game is great. So for Otegi, if you think about 
the fact that yes, he's a little bit shorter off the tee, but if he does get himself into trouble because of some long range iron shots, I, I trust him to get up and down. And especially as the score is going to be nearer that kind of level pile, it's weird with the take. I kind of feel of it as like a grinder, and he's just absolutely blown away about our armor field. But that that course, like you said, uh, is suited to the kind of grinding mentality. So I think the take is perfectly built for this and very similar to last week I just feel like Bjork and Otegi very obvious like I felt Hoygaard and Odderson were last week and I don't want to try and reinvent the wheel by going long shot heavy so I've kind of stuck with my guns with those two guys at the top of the market yep yep I think that's fair I think our cards kind of suit the way each of us normally approach the weeks um, or at least have started off this year so I think sticking with the strategy is a good idea and we've kind of aligned at times on this middle ground player um, yeah on some, some success for us early on. And Johannes Veerman is the one um, that, that is in this middle ground that I, I'm really intrigued at. You know, when you look at Veerman, um, who's, you know, 35 to one at DraftKings Sportsbook, best number of their 37s, you know, Veerman is somebody that cut his teeth in, in this neck of uh, the world, right? You know, he was playing on the Asian tour, on the Korea tour, on the Asian development tour, you know, five, four, I think 2019 was his last Asian tour events uh, where he was playing here. And then when you look at his style of game, this is a similar conversation to even the way we discussed this last week, right? He finishes uh, inside the top 20, right? Last week, 19th. It's kind of oddly priced still, you know, I mean, him coming off back to back top 20s, you know, in eighth place the week before, you know, to land him near 40 to one, just in general with Veerman in this field at that price a year and a half ago. And that's kind of why he was somewhat popular last week. He still seems mispriced to me in some ways. You know, he has the strength when it looks at this type of game. I mean, you look at some of his better performances, you know, he was top 10 at, um, at the Porsche European Open last year, which was where, you know, Green Eagle is, you know, he had won, um, right, I think his win was at the Czech Masters, which wasn't as difficult, but he has shown that success, shown that length off the tee, shown that he's played well this part of the world. What more do you have to add to Veerman? No, it, it, it is very much the case that what you said about Veerman, it's just he grew up playing Asian or golf and he played it very, very well. I think his pair, one of his parents is from this part of the world, but he's finished fourth and 12th in Malaysia, second in Indonesia, obviously the two neighbouring countries uh, to where we are this week. Nothing really to dislike about what he's done so far. Like I said last week, he, I thought he was overpriced last week. He was overlooked and he did very little to squash that kind of thought. So I love I love him and I, I can't see any negatives about playing him this week. Yeah, and it's still, I mean, being a popular selection early on, I mean, he is tipped by Brad, he's tipped by Ben, you know, like somebody where that, and you're still getting a number on him. If we look, you know, later on Monday, like this is this is strong opportunity for Veerman, and, and I, I love it. Um, when we keep going down, you've got a little bit of time before your next selection. This can kind of be where I jump in. Um, so this is an odd one for me here. Most would probably think I would jump on Riku, Rikuya Hoshino. I was pretty excited about him, right? You know, 40s, 45s is kind of short after one successful week there. Now, I don't know if I can necessarily say, you know, exactly what he was playing. I mean, you pulled in the Volva, you know, China. That's a little bit closer than, right, Japan would be playing on the Japanese tour. I don't know the similarities as much to to those courses, Um but I mean, you know, a win, second, eighth, eighth, seventh in his previous five starts on the Japanese tour, then finishes eighth, you know, last week or no fourth last week um, on the DP World Tour. I was pretty intrigued there if we can get some numbers. Um, sixth actually is where he finished, just outside the places last week. But I'm gonna take a leap of faith here, Tom, uh, a big one, um, and it's because when I really was getting into the DP World Tour, you know, or European Tour five, six years ago. When difficult courses showed up, there was one golfer that I love to gravitate towards. Um, we don't have this event any longer, but the Hero Indian Open used to be the one that they would just, you know, destroy them on. I mean, people would be quadruple bogeys left and right. You know, like it was a difficult course, one of his best courses he has had. And to me, you know, there's question marks with health. Hasn't played more than one event since 2021. And it's beef. It's Andrew Johnston. Um, you know, when you look at him, he did play in Dubai. He made the cut. He withdrew last week. Ras Al Khaimah said he had to get an injection in his thumb, but on his way to Singapore. So here we are on Monday again discussing. 
if Beef tees it up, I feel confident that he's completely healthy in the sense of, you know, going to complete the event. If he withdraws, he withdraws, you get your money back. I'm totally fine with that. 70s, you know, is is a little bit lower than what you might suspect for somebody like him. But you go through the years and where Beef popped up the most was, you know, courses that required short game skill and, you know, a, a bigger test than most is where he really thrived at. And I'm willing to take the shot and we don't have much sample size on him outside of you know five years ago when these type of things we've seen a lot and winning a lot or i mean contending a lot you know but man the upside was sky high for beef when he was playing at his peak and i think there's also a little perspective in his life you know you see him now with his youngest child that he has seems to be happy doing well better mental place than he was when he kind of left the game in 21 right so uh, i'm excited for beef's return and i'll take a shot at 70 to 1. The only, the only the only thing I have of Andrew Johnson, um, I always said that he kind of went downhill a little bit when his popularity grew because I think people aren't built to cope with that, and he was one of them. I felt the same about Marcus Armitage, who is someone that is fairly popular this week. Um, I, I consider them very similar people, good ball strikers who have got a bit of a fandom because they've got a quirky nickname or their, their appearance or whatever. Um, and I just feel like they get a little bit um, off kilter. They get a bit of an injury, not sure how they can come back, etc. cetera. Uh, but I just think with Beef, like he's a class player. And most of the time you would think 65, 70 to one isn't a bad price. There's just a lot of unknowns with him at the moment, like you said and alluded to. And I just feel like he's the type of player that doesn't really, his odds don't get elevated to, to match his kind of question marks, I guess. Yeah, I, I you know, the field, I think the field plays into it, right? Yeah. You're having Bob being the, the favorite, deservingly so. Um, yeah, and and I mean, we haven't seen, you know, steady short game out of beef in a long time, too, when, when it was able to pop, at least. Um, I just, when I, when I think about how I want to play this course out, he is just what comes to my mind. And so does the next guy, truthfully. Um, and he's not in any type of form. He doesn't have any other health questions, but... You know, when I think of, again, those type of courses, I, I even think of Valderrama, you know, where where he was a winner. Uh, and that's John Catlin, right? Uh, John Catlin had a, a brutal end of the year, I would say. He missed one, two, three, four, five out of his last nine cuts. Um, the other two finished, other two made cuts were T59, T60, and one event in which he popped up at Valderrama, T11, winner there. Even his victory uh, against your next selection in Austria was a battle. That was a difficult course. I remember it kind of being a little bit longer. Uh, maybe, I don't know. It was just, they battled it out. I think he won at 14 under. Uh, but they kind of stretched it from the field, both of those two selections. But Catlin is almost identical to the Veerman, you know, protege, except he's probably more of a winner, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah definitely. That that's the thing that you can you know bank your head on, lean your your head on. I mean, he in a 21, 20, 19, 18, so a four year stretch won seven times. You know, four, three of those being on the Asian tour in eighteen. Um, you know, in nineteen, one in Thailand um, when he came, and and that you know I just I, back against the wall, man. I trust Catlin. I trust him a lot, and. You know, his short game pops up, but he just finds a way in these difficult type of tests to be there. So comfort around the world in that game, I'm in at 100s. So the thing is, so you, you've got a, and I was speaking a little bit about this to Brad earlier and, and Jason as well. Like you, you have a decision to make with Catlin because I don't think he's playing well enough to, to contend and win. Um, you, you kind of pointed out to his miscuts and things like that. I think when he was playing his best, he was making cuts, not really doing anything, and then coming good at his best courses. But on the counter to that, he finished 11th of Valderrama, which is a sign that when he gets to those suitable golf courses, he can play well. So Asia is definitely the best place for him. That's where he cut his teeth. That's where he's, um, you know, come to his best. He is a winner, does have the profile, scrambles well. Just wonder if he's just not in the form. And I would say watch him after a round and get involved in play but he's the type of player that people know that you can trust him in contention like you said that if he's even within four or five shots you're not going to get the price so um if you like him play him uh now at the 100 to one because that'll be the best price you can probably get on him like if you want to get involved um i just i'm having a hard time seeing it just because he's not been playing well for probably a, 
even longer than those missed cuts as well. Like, I think you're going back to the Irish Open last year for the time where he really felt like he was playing well. Yeah, it's it's question, and that's kind of how I'm approaching the week is is kind of diving in. I mean, yeah, Irish Open he had a great stretch, and he goes on runs. Like even when he won in 21, it wasn't the best lead in form. He popped a couple weeks later for a fifth. You know, like he he seems to carry the form, but you got to start the form somewhere, and it hasn't. Um, really started so it is, he, it is he's just a he's a limited player so you don't expect him to go on these kind of 10th 15th 20th win kind of runs right yeah. you just you you want to see something from him and i haven't seen i know he only missed the cut on a number last week but it's still just like another week where he's only getting two rounds under his belt it's tina green it's, was much better last week right? yeah that, and that's great i mean if like maybe in his head he's like right i get my t screen game ready on a course that doesn't suit me at all and i'll be going to asia next week where I, i'm perfectly suited um you, you just know you have no idea what he's thinking if he's thinking that then great he's a a perfect bet really yeah now in that i skipped over your selection here hmm. um remember the playoff between him and Kiefer? that was yeah. it was tough it was like unbelievable and then right he he to he he pulled the daniel gavins where he double waterballed it uh on the par three after catlin like bounced it off the wood um that, that was a fun one but hit me uh talk me into why on Kiefer. yeah i mean Kiefer for me was we were looking at driving accuracy for this event originally originally and i think there's probably more distance needs to be involved in accuracy because of that back nine but there are plenty of water hazards here there's plenty of sort of positional shots that even on the shorter holes you need to be on the right side of the fairway and Kiefer leads the tour tips rankings um for the last three months in driving accuracy you go back and he was kind of i think seventh overall for the year last year he's right up there right now as well Ategi is probably the only kind of more accurate driver of the ball in this field. So that's a massive plus. Then you look at the fact he's kind of got fifth and 12th place finishes in Malaysia, which I like. Fifth and 11th place. I'm obviously doing a bit of a service, actually. He's finished 38th in both of those two events in Abu Dhabi and Dubai as well. So, again, you're kind of expecting him to take a step forward now that the field is weakened a little bit. The price wasn't great. I mean, the, the 70 to 1, 75 to 1 number isn't, you know, outstanding. But I just think that a player of his pedigree, you know, you mentioned the fact that he lost in that playoff. He's also won last year on the in the Czech um, event, uh, the Czech Masters. He beat Gavin Green, which again, kind of gives me some sort of hope that Gavin Green would be someone you'd probably look to in this part of the world, beats him. He's lost a playoff to, to Rafael Jacqueline uh, as well before. I think that's nine extra holes to do that. So he, he's, you know, conceivably could have been a three-time winner on, on the DP World Tour. Um, and it just feels like a, a part of the world and, and a strength of field that he can relish. And yeah, at 75 to one on drafting sports, but I think Maximilian Kiefer makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I, I think getting over the line he he's one of those golfers I think it meant a lot to. Yeah. Like, you know, when, when he was somebody we just knew almost if he sniffed contention, it just was we were we were waiting for a fallback. He only I remember when he tried to chase down Higo in the Canary Islands. He tries to chase down Catlin, you know, and he almost gets there both times and just falls short. And it was very strong to to get over the line uh for him. Uh, I think there's another popular selection um in this area that makes sense after you know two top fifteens. That's Rafa Cabrera Bayo. Yeah. Um, you know, I think he um, definitely finished the year out stronger than the the way most of 2022 went for him. Um, so, and you could see him with, you know, I mean, he's, he's a journeyman, you know, somebody who's found success in this area of the world in the past. Um, you know, betting beef versus Cabrera Bayo, you know, you, you make the odds argument a little bit stronger when you kind of compare right by there. But then you also know the pedigree of, of Cabrera Cabello and, you know, you think about kind of even, even the other guys that we've selected um, in this range. And it'll be interesting to see him this week. Um, and, and it makes sense, the popularity there. Now, I'm striving um, to nail somebody I don't think I've ever gotten right in my career. Um, <laughs> I'll give it up trying. It, it makes so much sense for Will Besseling to be successful this week. So much sense. You finally, you know, show a little form in your final, uh, you know, your last four holes. You know, you, you get our boy Bariff on him, just ready to shove in any sign of life you get with Besseling. And then, you know, you see him, you know, he's he's top 12 in tee to green. He is strong off the tee again. And he's somebody who normally, you know, is is one, I would say he's one of the sneaky best drivers in all of the world. Like he is very, probably a top five driver on the DP World Tour. Um, if you really thought about it, now, as of late, it's been bad. You know, his, his game has been brutal. 
But again, where does he pop up recently? You know, he, he makes the cut at Valderrama. There's a stretch of made cuts with nothing. His best finish of the year was that second at Green Eagle. You know, you, you go back a little bit further and you see another place where he had success. But again, that Valderrama with a T3 being probably his best finish um, since he came on to the DP World Tour. And this was another course comparison that a few people brought up um, was Leopard Creek. Yeah. Leopard Creek is a, a strong test, uh, difficult test, longer. You know, I think it's a really good comparison. And we've seen Vesseling do very well there, too. So those three courses you build in, and that is the profile of what he has been. And he comes off a good week of finally breaking through a little bit. And I think the 100 to 1 is nice. I, I do like that number with Vesseling. Um, I'm scared because, again, I've been in this spot with him before where he's shown life and he misses the cut by five, you know. But um, I, at this number, I think it's definitely worth chancing. Yeah, I mean, if there's any sort of stock in the kind of China link, I know it's not that close, but he's finished third there in the past at the Hainan Open. Um, yeah, I, I think everything you've said about Bessling is absolutely fair. He's he's one of the better drivers of the ball. He's gone for a rough patch, bounced back last week with a 13th place finish, and he either kicks on from there or it's one good result in a bad run. I mean, this is kind of how I feel a little bit about Catlin, right? Like, like he finished 11th with Valderrama and has been littered with miscuts either side. And I can see that being the case with Bessling. But if you were just looking at course fits and, and strategy like you are, you're looking for a strong driver of the golf ball. Look at one that's finished 13th last week and one that's triple digits. Bessling six those boxes. So I have yeah. no qualms with him being picked. I think I think once you get to the the Catlin's at 100 to 1, the Bessling's at 100 to 1, once they, I think you'll probably say this on every show and people get bored of me saying it, but once you get to these 100 to 1 marks, you you just look at players that fit the profile. They, they're 100 to 1 because they're not reliable. If they were making cuts every week and finishing top 20, they're not 100 to 1, right? Even if even if their win equity is fairly low because they protect themselves against the top five. So um, I, I think it's fine. Yeah, perfect. Um well, it's a little bit of a shorter show today uh, before we get into our, our three more long shot, shot selections here. Um, make sure to give a shout out to our audio listeners. Um, you can find us on daily, daily fantasy sports picks and bets. The mix um, Mayo media network there supports us um, on all platforms. So we appreciate that. Any rating reviews, subscribe goes a long way. Keeping the show running uh, fast start to the year, you know, it's a place as a, a winner early on. It's been a lot of fun to kick off the year feeling good about it. And when we get to these long shots, like you said, kind of a pulse or something, or if you're going to go with uh, a similar theme, um, you know, and this is what I've stuck with. If we go, you know, Green Eagle, and if we go Valderrama, there was only one golfer last year who finished top 10 or top five in both of those events. And it was the only top fives of this golfer's year last year. Um, if you told me also if Will, that Will Bessling is, is 37 and this golfer is six years younger, I would have said you're lying because it doesn't even make sense because I feel like he's been around forever. But um, Joaquin Lagergren, somebody who, again, making a, a guess at a course attempt. He has been somebody who's found year after year success at the Alfred Dunhill Lynx Championship, right? You could bet him at any number. And you wake up on Sunday morning, he's normally within a sniff of that leaderboard. Um, and so maybe there is something to a course degree um, that that finds success for him. And you're hoping to find that here. Not like course history in a sense, but, you know, you put him on a, a certain track and his short game, right? I mean, the, the thing that gets it done for him is he is one of the best, if not the best putter on the DP World Tour, right? So that travels. I mean, that's, that brought him to success at Valderrama, that that he actually struck it pretty decently um, in Germany when he played there. But, you know, that bag of tricks. And he started off the year rusty, but he his second miscut, um, so he played both the Rolex Series events, his second one, he shot a 67 in round, tr- round two. Um, so at least showed somewhat of progress forward, um, closing that out. And I feel a little bit more confident in that. I would have liked a deeper number, um, than 150 in some ways, but it, it it makes sense. So that's one for me. And then um, if you didn't think I was gonna have an amateur on my card, you know, you guessed wrong. Come on. So uh, if we're going, there's two of them actually in the field that caught my eye. Wang Yi Ding is one of them, who was a U.S. Junior Champion a couple uh, months ago. I think it was last summer. Who popped up on the Australian events recently. But I am going with the one that probably caught the world by storm, in my opinion, last year. Um, and that's it's going to be tough, Tom. It's going to be really tough. <laughs> Rachanan, I know how to pronounce the first name. It's Chananawan. 
Um, that's you're, not you're, bad, man. You, I mean, look, I'm not doing better than that. Pronunciation is not my strong point, so Ratchinon is good for me. So, like, TK, you know, he that's yeah. what kind of goes by. And he's he's the amateur 15-year-old, or um, he might be 16 now, um, that is on live. Um, that, that got, you know, he's the only amateur on live, right? The other guys made the leap at least to professional um, when they made the jump. Um, and, and he's the one that won an Asian tour event at the age of 15. Uh, so, you know, when you look at where he's found the success at, right, um, you know, he, he has played in this area of the world. He had a T4, or I think it was uh, a third, the Thailand Masters, a third at the Singapore International last year on the Asian Tour. He won the Asian Mixed Cup. I double check where that Asian Mixed Cup um, was at. But again, he just played um, events in this area of the world and, and had success at, at a young, young age, right? So I think at 150s, I mean, he was in the Asian tour event last week, T6, the halfway point. That was a, a bona fide, I don't want to say it was, a, it, was, it, was, it was as strong as a PJ tour event. It, right? it, it, it was might, a really strong event. But like that is, he was T6, you know, he blew yeah. up over the weekend, really bad on Saturday, but heck, I mean, being sixth in that at halfway point is very strong. Do you, do you know who he was paired with on Saturday? Probably with some of the big boys, right? Well, I'm just I'm just thinking that is probably going to have an impact. Like I remember there being a big video for Rection on at last year's Saudi International thing, or maybe a, a similar event where he was getting a lot of exposure, uh, a lot of kind of videos at the start. I can't remember who it was, but someone went over and sort of congratulated him on his amateur career so far. And this this Asian mixed cup he talks about was was in Thailand, so it's it's close enough to to be relevant. Um, like you said, made him the young, youngest male winner on a major tour. He was 15 and 37 days old. So to me, that I knew you were going to pick him. Like this is yeah. just right in your wheelhouse. Um, but the, the sixth last week after 34 holes, 36 holes really kind of uh, encouraged me. I must admit. He was paired with big bad Jason Kokrak. You know, it's scary man. Yeah, that that that, <laughs> that that dominating presence. But um, yeah, like I mean, look. Maybe it's Jason Kograt's not very friendly, doesn't talk to you. Right? It's just the leaderboard, right? The halfway point. Answer, Young, Saddam, Kano, Kano, John, that, that, man, Kawa, Kanjana, Saddam, who, S-A-D-O-M, the one who's been a lot of success yeah. in the Asian tour, right? Leishman, Ushazen, Herbert, Kokrak, right around him, Richard Bland, HV3, Reed, Paul Casey, all those guys are in the final groups with him. And then it's Snyman, Saddam, and Rachanan um, that are paired around those guys, right? Like it is... It was a big leaderboard to be a part of. Yeah, I, I just think that, look, he is still 15. He's 15 until the 4th of March. So, yeah. Yep. Awkwardly, I turned 32 days later. So uh, that makes me feel a bit older. But he, you know, th there's just nothing negative to say about him. What can you say negatively about a 15-year-old playing as well as he is? Yep, 100%. 150 is there. All right, close us out on your long shot here, Tom. Yeah, so this this long shot, as I sort of alluded to earlier, is one that I absolutely loved. And then I read kind of Ben and, and Paul's pieces as well and, and feel much better. So I picked Levy based, Alexander Levy, purely based on his Asian form. So he's a two-time winner at the China Open. He's also got a third there. He's got a third at the Thailand Masters. He's got fourth and eighth place finishes at the Shenzhen um, International, which is in China as well. 14th in the WGC HSBC Champions. 25th at the Ballantines event, I said, was uh, here as well. That in itself is a is a massive bank of form, right? Like That, that is everything. Then he, you look at uh, Green Eagle being a comp. He's finished second and 13th there. He won that event the year before at the other course, which I could never pronounce, but it's basically a similar sort of test as well. So we're talking about Levy, who has undeniable form in this part of the world. He on his day is up there with the very best in this field. I would put him close to the likes of Smith and McIntyre and people like that if he's playing his best, which it's been a while since he's done that. But you go back to kind of last year and he was completely like written off. I think he missed most of 2020. He played maybe four or five events and he missed cut twice, withdrew once and made one cut. Um, it's been a tough time for him, but he came back at the Abu Dhabi Championship, made the cut, finished tied 50th. He's missed the two cuts since. And that's the kind of concern. This this is where the Andrew Johnston argument that you, that you would make is that they've only been gone missing since injuries. So 
I am going to take a chance on Levy because he's 200 to one yeah. in that respect. You know, like that. That's my only. That's my only thing. Like the only negative I can find about both of those golfers is that their form since they've come back from injury hasn't inspired. But on their day, at their best, these should be the perfect golf courses and test for them. Yeah, basically, there's three golfers like that: that Callum Hill, Andrew Johnson, and yeah. Xander Levitt, right? Um, and then what? What is uh, Hill this week? He is 66s, right? So, so what's the reason for for Alexander Levy being three times the price? I think I'm just, one time I like that. Probably just because he's been out so long. Like it, it has been. It's a, were two. I mean, they missed like all of last year, right? Yeah. I mean, and, look, and I, I just think at 2021 he finished second at the Kazoo Classic. It's not. It's not like he's not played well ever for like five years. You know, this is a was he a five time winner on a DP World Tour? Should be one, two, three, five. Yep. Be impressive. That's interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. There's not many of those in this field. I can I can assure you of that. 32 years old. Uh, yep. Got the got that pedigree. You know, twice uh, in this event. Lost the playoff at Green Eagle. Yeah, I, I have nothing negative other than the fact that he's been injured, and I don't know quite what state he's in since he's come back. Yeah, hmm. that is intriguing. The other one that was intriguing that I didn't mention because his price is a bit lower too. Um, we talked Hoshino. Um, his tattoo was the first round leader last week. Yeah. Um, we kind of talked about him when he graduated, right? Like pedigree of, you know, Japanese golfers um, coming off the Japan golf tour that are being winners. If you look at one that was um, a number one amateur in the world at one point, he has had three stars on the PGA tour now in a row. He made two of the three cuts, you know, basically dead last of those who made, who made the cut, but that's uh, Taiga Semakawa. Um, yeah. So he's playing this week. He's 80 to one. I mean, he had one, two, three, four, five, six wins to his name um, this past year or in his last 25 starts, I guess. So five of those were in 2022, Um, one being on the Abema tour as an amateur and then two being on the Japanese golf tour. Uh, And those were, I believe, his two first starts after he became a professional. So. You know, he, he's pr- it's priced in 80 to one. You know, you're not you're not getting the Ganda 500 to one. <laughs> um, but he's somebody to watch early on here. too. I, I think this this event was loaded with people that I'd have loved to have bet. But sometimes just have to give up a little bit like Ashton Wu, 60 to one. We talk about him all yep. the time coming back to Asia. Um, I thought Cabrera Bello was one. Gavin Green was very, very hard to lay out, like, leave out yep. in this part of the world. Matthew Pavon played incredibly well last week for... Yep. The most of it um and i'm glad he didn't win because i talked about him and didn't bet him um so yeah i think that's it i don't i don't want to keep going on we, we want yep. to wrap these up but um yeah just a week where there was a long short list for sure all right you go first with your card then yeah so alexander bjork is my favorite bet of the week 28 to 1 on DraftKings sportsbook adrian tagi is 25 to 1 on DraftKings sportsbook uh johannes veerman 35 37 to 1 is the best number that you can get Maximilian Kiefer, uh, 75 to 1. And my sort of long to, long short downtown bet is Alexander Levy at 200 to 1. Yep, I am in on Johannes Veerman, 37 to 1. Beef Johnston, Andrew Johnston uh, on the book, 70 to 1. John Catlin, 100 to 1. Will Bessling, 100 to 1. Joachim Lagergen, 150 to 1. Rachanan Chanawananat. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's great. Oh, good. 150 to 1. And I think I'm going to join you there on the Alexander Levy, too, just to take a shot. At such a deep number. Um, best of luck, everybody. Uh, again, we have a fun week ahead of us. Hopefully, the difficult test where they battle it out. I love those even par. Good score. I appreciate that. Now, it is a par, or expected to be a par 72. It played as a par 71 prior, so that could adjust that by a few strokes, but uh, you score under par, you got a chance this week. Yeah, and I, and I think I just love these events in this part of the world. Like they come on at a nice time, like really early in the morning uh, over here. Really early for you guys, but um, you know you wake up and and the the rounds are already in full flow. I like that, so yeah. um, I'll enjoy this event. Yep, amen. Good luck, everybody, and we will catch you around next week. Thanks again. 